Let us pray. Lord God, you have declared that your kingdom is among us. Open our eyes to see it, our ears to hear it, our hearts to hold it, and our hands to serve it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So let's put it out there. You know, sometimes passages confuse us from the Bible. Sometimes passages in the Bible disturb us. And this one manages to do both, for many of us anyway. Some of the words here, some of the images from Jesus are tough to hear, a little tough to deal with. And make you go, what? Or even, ew. But they're there. Jesus telling his disciples they must eat his flesh and drink his blood. No wonder the early church was um, criticized and misunderstood as a cannibalistic cult when uh, words like this were, were part of it. But he said it, at least according to John, he said it. And not just in passing either. He says it several times in several ways. He dances with it. He circles back to it. Um, In the Bible and in the New Testament, especially in John, very much so, when something is repeated over and over, it means, yeah, pay attention. This is real. This This is what I want you to know. But it leaves us wondering why. Why did he say it? And what does it mean? And what do we do with it? Well, you're at an advantage this morning if you were worshiping with us last week because Father Jim gave a wonderful sermon on the passage immediately before this one, tied to it. This is a continuation of that. And Father Jim, as Father Jim does gave us a a really good um, uh, uh, bringing out of of meaning from that and uh, uh, talking about it in in ways that help make it sense of Jesus um, giving his body as bread for us. Um, So I will take the baton from Father Jim today and delve a little further into it and deal with this part of it, which is, uh, which is challenging, but here it is. By the way, I was a pastor with my own church, preached for um, over 22 years. Uh, this passage came up in the lectionary at least seven times. I never preached on it the whole time. I always went to the Old Testament or the, or the uh, epistle or something else. But uh, I just always backed away from it. Not today. Not today. So here we are in John, which is um, the unique uh, member of the four Gospels. It's nonlinear. It's more spiritual. It's mysterious in many ways. But it's often called, and it is the incarnational gospel. It begins right toward the beginning with the words, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Still yet in its first chapter, Jesus is declared the Lamb of God, both by John and by himself and others. Of course, a lamb was meant not only to be sacrificed and celebrated, but eaten as well. And then several times Jesus refers to himself as the bread of life. But when he proclaims, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, he seems to say it as if he means it literally. But he can't mean it literally, can he? Of course not. Not only is it impossible for us now to eat his flesh, and drink his blood. But it was pretty much impossible for them back then, too. 
I don't know what biblical literists do with this passage, but um, that's their problem. So obviously it's not directly literal. There's something else going on, even though he says it seeming like it is. Well, Father Jim last week took it right to the Eucharist, and I'm going to amen that and, and carry on with that. This is Jesus talking about, yes, eating his body and drinking his blood in communion, in the Eucharist, ultimately. But you might say, if you're aware that the story of the Last Supper isn't in John, it's in the other three Gospels, it's even in Corinthians, where it's described, the words of institution, are there, the meal itself uh, is narrated, but it's not in John. Although in the 13th chapter, we're aware that they're having a Passover meal, and within that is the foot washing, but not an actual description of the Last Supper, which we have uh, made the Eucharist. But it's believed that since John's gospel came later, the Eucharist was established among the Christian community. It was a given. It was central to them. And quite possibly, there was no need for John to tell the details of the supper. They were well known. The sixth chapter of John is often referred to as John's Eucharist. This is where he deals with it, but in a different way, from Jesus' own lips, delving deep, spiritually, mysteriously, into what it is, and what it is meant to be, and what it means. And his words tie the Eucharist to something, something that is woven into this part of the Gospel of John, something that is of ultimate importance and very deep mystery. Eternity. Eternity. It gets five mentions in the 12 verses leading up to this, and a few more in our reading this morning. Verse 54, those who eat meat, my, blood, my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. It's a recurring and revolving theme, the notion of eternity, forever, non-ending life. Bought stamps recently, and I noticed, as they have for a long time, the post office sells forever stamps means I, you can use them forever without having to add any other stamps to them. Forever. Or at least until the post office goes out of business. I'm not sure they really know what forever is. We hear love songs about eternal devotion and how I will love you forever. But is there really an understanding of forever, unending time. I ran across a cloud storage uh, service the other day that promised eternal storage of my files, okay? We throw these concepts around somewhat casually, but the truth is we really can't conceive of unending, eternal, actual forever. We're intrigued by it because we'd rather avoid death if we could. But we live in a finite world, and our human understanding can only really grasp finite concepts. Everything has to have a beginning and an ending, right? We understand things within these boundaries. The 
concept, an idea of eternity breaks in and somewhat disturbs our understanding of life. Jesus' words of eating flesh and drinking blood also break in and confuse and disturb us, as I said in the beginning. Jesus offers himself as the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and sharing in that eating and drinking allows us to participate in that which is eternal, forever, everlasting, world without end, even if we don't understand it, and we don't. I think we can't. This is where Father Jim's words from last week about faith and trust in what Jesus says and who Jesus is for us is important. But I believe that our participation in eternity, whatever it might be, and however it might work, is not the whole point here. Maybe not even the main point when talking about communion, the Eucharist. Yes, the Eucharist brings us to the doorstep of eternity, and that is, that's beyond awesome. And we want to honor that mystery, but not get lost in it. Because what's most important is that it bonds us together. Communion bonds us together and empowers us to be the community of Christ's love for each other and especially for the world. Love that is eternal and has the power of eternity. In the body we eat and the cup we drink and the word we hear and the prayers we pray and the presence we feel come down to us from heaven. They are eternal as nothing else can be. The incarnate body of Christ is present in this finite world through us. The eternal God became incarnate in this finite world, not so much to rescue us from it, but to empower us by his eternal spirit within us and through us to break in and be God's presence in the world. To God be all glory and honor now and forever.